Good morning. I'm Jan Irwin, Head of Education at the Ulrich Museum. Thanks to everyone for joining us this morning to kick off the first in a series of 10 paired faculty talks taking place during the 23rd Faculty Biennial. It's all part of the process on view through May 8th. Now in its 46th year, the Biennial showcases the breadth of creative work and research being undertaken by the faculty of the School of Art and Design and Creative Industries. In art history, art education, ceramics, curatorial practice, drawing, graphic design, painting, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and new media. This series of talks on the Biennial's theme, It's All Part of the Process, seeks to prompt reflections and start conversations about each faculty member's personal process, highlighting the diversity of activities and contribute that contribute to creative practice from research to studio time to interact to interactions with colleagues and students and beyond. This morning we welcome Tana Birchinal and Megan Newart. Tana Birchinal is the studio manager for ADSI. She received her MFA in visual arts with a focus in sculpture from Clemson University. And her work in the biennial is ties vines a sculptural piece from 2020. Megan Ewart is an administrative specialist and adjunct instructor for ADSI. Originally from Wichita, she received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Kansas City Art Institute and her Master of Fine Arts from the New York Academy of Art. She is the recipient of a full merit scholarship to KCAI, um, an NYAA fellowship nomination, a summer studio residency hosted by Shanghai University and Central Academy of Fine Arts, as well as being selected for the NYAA WNA Eric Fischel Artist in Residence Teaching Program. Specializing in figurative drawing and painting, her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally. And her work, Little Helen, three to six drawings, also from 2020, is on view in the exhibition as well. Following the presentations, I'm going to go ahead and um, bring everybody into the conversation. So it'll take me a few minutes. I'll have to do it one by one, but it'll, you'll receive an invitation to turn on your cameras and your mics, and that way you can ask your questions of Tana and Megan. Everyone, please welcome Tana Birchinal. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. When I think of my art process, I think of all the wonderful tidbits of information I received over the years from different artists that uh, I respect dearly, but rarely do I think about it in my own practice. Um, it's a weird, it's a weird thing for me. Uh, but this this presentation has made me focus on the things that impact my process the most. Um, I'd like to start by showing you some works that deal with hair. Hair is the primary media that I use the most in my work. And then the presentation will move towards the piece that is in the Ulrich currently. So my aunt would always like to say I come from a long line of women that can't sit still and won't shut up. Um, I think I missed out on the talkative genes in my family and got an extra helping of not being able to sit still. Uh, that brings me to the first point in my process as an artist. I think better when I am working with my hands, my brain understands the world better when I have tactile experiences. Um, I think that's why I work with sculpture and why I work with the materials and media I choose to work with. A lot of my earlier work did experiment with hair and I love human hair in particular because I find it irresistible as a media, uh, touch-wise, but also I feel that hair can live in different contexts while still being representative of bodies. I started using hair my first year of graduate school. 
my grandmother uh, was a hairdresser her whole life. Uh, but during the time that I began to work with hair, she began to decline in health. And I associate me working with hair uh, as a way to deal with the grieving process. Uh, hair stuck with me. Uh, I haven't put it down since. It, like I said, it's a context that I just love to explore and it, it never gets bored for me, boring. So this work almost didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, and it's mostly my fault <laughs> because of the way that I work, because of my process. Um, this work challenged me every step of the way. Uh, and it kind of brings me to the second point I have in my process that really affects me as an artist and that things that I keep around me um, in my studio and in my head, uh, it affects and influences the artwork that I produce. So for example, one of the artists that I look up to greatly, Janine and Tony, um, when she completed her work in Habits, she realized that she had a small postcard of Frida Kahlo's The Broken Column in her studio. And it's a little bit uh, unmistakable, the similarities between the harness and the back brace uh, in these works. Uh, even though it was probably a, a unintentional um, influence, the things that, that are around me and are in my head will affect my work every time. So I have to be very picky about what is in my studio and what is in my space sometimes. So it was no different for me uh, in this work. <laughs> uh, these are good examples of what was in my head and what was in my studio at the time that I was making. Uh, a friend of mine about two years ago now um, shared with me a trauma that she had experienced when she was younger. Uh, her confiding in me made me reevaluate the time that we shared together when we were young. And immediately I knew I had to make artwork about how I felt about that situation and that 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 her being able to confide in me. Uh, I kept these mass produced ceramic dolls in my studio wanting to deal with them for a long time. And I remember as a child, I would be gifted these types of dolls and they had these this really weird context around them and that they were supposed to be loved and cherished and played with. But at the same time, nothing was supposed to be done to compromise their uh, very manicured appearance. So it's kind of like they lived in these two spaces. And that made me think of uh, how child children shouldn't be um, heard, but instead seen. And from there, I went into European fairy tales because that's just how my brain works. Um, <laughs> I had a wonderful professor in graduate school, um, Andrea Fieger, who encouraged me to research hair in different cultures. And one of the things that I came across in my research was European fairy tales and the use of hair, um, particularly blonde hair, as a symbol of wealth, purity, virtue, and, and sometimes voices, um, or the a voice of a female. And as always, I think about beauty standards when working with hair in particular. Um, I'm constantly confronted by this uh, because of how I source my hair in America and uh, the, the process of going and uh, actually acquiring hair is, uh, is interesting. It's a completely unregulated market, kind of like the art field. And uh, we can talk more about that later um, if we'd like, because I could talk about that forever. So armed with all of that knowledge, all of that influence, uh, I started making the work and it took me a ridiculous amount of time, uh, more time than it usually does for any one given piece. Uh, and I realized at that time, I was trying to make the work say way too much. And it brings me to my other point in 
my process. Uh, I have to keep it simple. I have to keep it pared down. Uh, if I'm working on too many problems or if I'm working on uh, a piece of artwork that I feel like should is saying too much, uh, there's a point in which I have to step back. Um, and it was no different for this piece. Uh, when it was halfway completed, I had to step back and reevaluate what I wanted the work to say versus what the work was already uh, accomplishing or trying to accomplish in its unfinished, unfinished state. Um, so this work is about the cumbersome experiences and sometimes toxic weight of feminine expectations, uh, both as an expression of shared connection and experiences between girls and as an overgrowth uh, that is carried into adulthood. The hair is a stand-in for feminine expectations, both acting as a soft bed or cushion and as a weight that keeps the dolls in place. There is a pair of scissors hidden in the composition um, underneath the doll's hair and out of their reach. The doll's depleted bodies prevent them from doing much but being cradled. And this was a decision, again, that took me a long time to process through. And ultimately I thought that this would be a better way to convey how draining it can be uh, to carry some of these expectations as, as a child and, and ultimately into adulthood. This work taught me a lot um, about how I work as an artist and also about how I want to start working in the future. That's the end of my presentation. Megan, I will hand it over to you. Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this chilly day. Let me share my screen. Okay. I'll try to make this as smooth as possible. I'm a little out of practice, but I have notes. So after image, death documentation and exposure therapy. I wanted to place a warning. Please be aware that photos of dying and deceased persons will be shown in this presentation. Okay. My work is primarily figurative and leans heavily toward portraiture. I am interested in the intricate dynamics of intimacy, the voyeurism, the elation, the permission and the boundaries inherent in expressing and receiving physical love. The work is almost always approached from the perspective of an outsider. I like to create engaging surfaces to my drawings and paintings that relay the physical reactions of the body to touch or surface sensation, while also considering the disconnect between the body's physical response to touch versus the emotional reaction. My work tends to be geared toward expressionism. It tends to favor selective finish and is more playful with color and shape. I've almost always used my own photographs as references and work from models I know personally, <clears throat> excuse me, friends and family. These photographs are jumping off points, offering a sense of rightness in my direction of making until surface and color take over. I think my work often photographs poorly. As a student, I decided that in this digital age in which most people experience art online, my goal as a maker is to create objects that have visual experiences that don't necessarily translate in a photo, a texture or a sheen, for example, something that makes viewing it in person work worthwhile. I learned to embrace and push this forward. 
When looking at art, I always consider what is visible at three distances, what translates from across a room, what moment sings from five feet away, and what detail betrays an artist's tenderness and passion for art making up close. I call that up close view the artist's kiss. You are as close to the surface as the artist was when they made it. Inspiration comes from all kinds of subjects, but one subject that is recurring is the depiction of family. Family photos are something I've always been obsessed with. I have become the keeper of thousands of photos and documents from both sides of the family dating back to the late 1800s. Um, from many, many photos, here's a group of selections I brought forward. A couple of my grandparents at their wedding, a double exposure that actually shows the moment of the kiss. A great grandmother and her first prize chicken from the fair. A picture of my grandfather and one of his brothers on stilts out in the country in Kansas. And this one's a little bit behind my screens here, but this figure right here is the same woman, younger, great grandmother Lucille and her younger sister Viola. And amazingly, this might be the only known photograph of this little girl who died at a young age. These photos have started have served as starting points for several works, copyright free references at hand for one, but also interesting fodder to play around with in Photoshop, layering imagery to make the known unknown. I utilize Photoshop as a way to spark my curiosity about an image. And with these photos, it made me think of the term persona, loving the idea of someone rather than the reality, recognizing that our fond memories of others are encapsulated ideas of individuals based on specific moments in time that don't reflect the fluid and changing circumstances and personalities, both public and private of those we love. Here's some additional photos of that type of work. In regard to the work in this exhibition, I wanted to talk about the process of how these works were made, including inspiration garnered from other artists, current events, and previous work. These two works here are part of a larger folio of works I created in a creative writing course while at KCAI. I created a series of collages about the collision of ideas surrounding alchemy, transformation, gender, and the abject. I took images from found sources only, including literary and medical illustrations, as well as advertisements. The images themselves were composed to be evocative, but I then began to consider adding text, or rather text that functioned like poetry, poetry pulled from the lines of existing stories. This one on the left, when under the plea of making the flesh white, the calf is bled, like bullets off the iron walls filling the space, eye off to the knee and to the head, which is removed, the carcass. Barking and barking, louder and louder, the barks rebounding, all the large veins and arteries up to the vertebrae, the skin taken. They are the lucky ones, the power of the motherless, reign of colors, first brown, then misery. Don Manuel discovers Beatrice. This one on the right is less about the text and more about the imagery from um, different social studies books, maps, and medical illustrations. Uh, the image on the left says, Mr. Dustin defending his children from the savages. And then on the bottom was ridding his country of a tyrant, the stricken president. Some of these works relied on text via the William Burroughs cut up method modeled on the right image by David Bowie, big fan. Uh, by picking and choosing poetic lines and rearranging them randomly, I began to curate language that elevated the imagery and provided more narrative possibilities. The image on the left is some early text put together in consideration of this new work in the exhibition. I was forced to seek out existing language that reflected the stories I wanted to tell, old turn of the century romance novels, highly dramatic, medical texts and contemporary literature. As I was cutting and pasting passages from texts that had a unique psychological edge and referenced similar themes, I was not reading these passages in context, but as individual lines. Out of this series, two standout images were created, pictured here. 
doll-like and stark, these medical illustrations referencing childhood illness and disease depict heads swathed in white cloth. These images utilize visual cues that I recognized from another source, death masks. And the wrapping is a signifier of death, a deceased subject. The image on the left, measles. Measles ate gentleness of an infinitely variable Queen Catherine. I almost held my breath too. One can go without food forever, not even a stubborn little girl. She was chewing and swallowing air. When you get hungry, you are no one, no one at all, height without mask, motion without motive. The work on the right, I might have to move my screen here to get this, there we go. Her inordinate cruel and selfish vanity with the sight of his agonies, chicken pox. I have tortured myself in body and spirit by wakeful nights, as well as the manner in which his gaze met mine. In hell, you look at your undeniable complexity and you think so exquisitely have I been fashioned. There's no reason I shouldn't live forever. Whereas looking at heaven, all you see is, and then it can repeat to the top, her inordinate cruel and selfish vanity with the sight of his agonies. These two works are currently in the show. Oops. Here is one of the supposed death masks of Mary Queen of Scots. Death masks were created less as objects of curiosity for public consumption, but rather typically for the purpose of documentation pre-photography as a reference for future portraiture of the subject. I myself am a budding collector of life and death masks, starting with a humble collection of two, one being a life mask of David Bowie. Behold, here are some up close shots. The physicality of these masks are intoxicatingly intimate. The imperfection of the skin surface is utterly human. Every pore, every mole, the texture of eyelashes. It is magical to have an unchanging view of someone long dead to the detail of lived intimate experience. Viewed at a proximity that suggests familiarity, family, friends, lovers. These objects act as proxy, stand-ins for the actual person. They possess the individual's aura within simple plaster. These objects have a power and demand a kind of respect. In regard to the past work, these medical illustrations and death masks reminded me of other morbid death-related imagery that I surround myself with on a daily basis. Once again, I just wanna put out a warning that you're going to see imagery of dying and deceased persons in this presentation. So, nice little meme to the left there. How was your year? This has been a year. The pandemic has greatly changed how we live and how we make art. When thinking about making work for this show based on this idea of process, I could only reflect on the subject that dominated 2020, death. This year has me thinking a lot about death. Due to the pandemic, a lot of peaceful people rather are closer to the death to the dead and dying than ever before. In February, 2020, I lost my maternal grandmother, Helen Brennis, to Alzheimer's. A gut punch, not long after that, in June of 2020, her husband, my grandpa, Alden Brennis, died of complications from multiple myeloma. Another punch, both were 88, she was given home hospice care, one of her last cognizant adamant wishes, while Alden Brennis, a man with very limited hearing and physical strength needing round the clock care was placed in a nursing home for just under four months. Locked down from visitors during COVID, his hearing could not allow him to use a phone and he communicated with family only through one-sided letters and visits through glass. Neither situation was easy and my family was not, were not rather the only ones to experience facility lockdowns and limited home health care. These are the headlines I saw in 2020. This is what is being discussed. Home health care, home funerals, a lack of home health aids, limited resources and access to care facilities. Throughout 2020, I thought a lot about pandemic art. What are artists making to reflect the experience of living in this time during this period of isolation and disease? Within my family photos, there are many coffin images. 
My family has always had a tendency to document the dying and the dead, and many people do. Making sure to take those oh so important photos with the grandparents, commenting that it may be their last Christmas. We have all these shared experiences, important memories, and yet we can't trust our own minds to maintain the detail, rather the overall resonant quality of those times. As a result, there is a strong instinct to document those we feel we are about to lose to preserve their memory in a more permanent way. And now we have these smartphones at our fingertips, these powerful cameras and recording devices. And here we are watching <clears throat> our loved ones up close and decline. Our instinct to document is readily fulfilled. The next slides are two family coffin photos from the 1920s when what was described by my great grandmother Lucille as swine flu killed multiple members of her family. She herself survived it. Two of her brothers, I believe Viola as well, died from swine flu or what she believed was swine flu. <clears throat> Out of the hundreds of photos, these are some of the very, exam very few examples that display the flu pandemic and its effects in the early 1900s. In fact, very few examples of pandemic art exist. Due to the overlap of flu and World War I, many felt it was dishonorable or stigmatized to die of disease instead of in the war serving the country. As a result, the flu of 1918 is hardly remembered. On the slide, there are two images of Camp Funston in Kansas. The top left is a photo postcard that belonged to my great great-grandfather, great-grandfather, Otto Brennis, um, who was serving at Camp Bunston at the time or around that time. More than a century after it killed upwards of 17 million people around the world, the 1918 flu pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu, has come back charging back into the public consciousness. The disease, the most devastating of its kind in modern history, bears some eerie similarities to COVID-19 especially in its person-to-person -person transmission and global impact. Yet in the annals of cultural history, the flu of 1918 is little more than a historical footnote. There are a few obvious depictions of the disease in canonized art and literature, and the images it recalls are not as vivid as those that followed, say, the AIDS crisis. Of the few examples of early pandemic art, at the height of his career, artist Egon Schiele, his wife, and his unborn child all died within a week of each other. His drawing of his wife, Edith, on her deathbed is striking in the knowledge that he too would be dead days later. <clears throat> Edward Monk, celebrated painter of the scream, survived the flu and depicted his experience in a couple of paintings. Other than this, very little artistic documentation. Author Laura Spenny noted there are very few cemeteries in the world that assuming they are older than a century don't contain a cluster of graves from the autumn of 1918 and people's memories reflect that. <clears throat> but there is no cenotaph, no monument in London, Moscow or Washington DC. The Spanish flu is remembered personally, not collectively. Personally, not collectively. The Victorian practice of post-mortem photography was once rampant, and these photos were prized possessions, posed images of the dead, often with loved ones. This practice, the dwelling on death, was tapered down by World War I. Via the New York Times article, The iPhone at the Deathbed, there was so much death, if everyone is mourning, you lose your fighting spirit, it's not patriotic. What's happening now is people are taking back that process. They want to show they've seen their person through to the end. It's your last bond and you want to document that. <clears throat> it was back in 2014 when I became aware that my maternal grandmother, Helen, was dying. <clears throat> Her kidneys were failing and she was developing Alzheimer's. Of the two maladies she feared Alzheimer's the most, she decided not to do dialysis and hoped her kidneys would take her before the Alzheimer's took her mind. At the time I had finished graduate school at NYAA and was living and working in New York. The news wrecked me. We were very close. She was a beloved matriarch of our family. In 2015, I moved back to Wichita and spent the time with her while her cognitive abilities were failing. 
it would be five years of struggle until her death in 2020. Prior to her death for several years, I started partaking in obsessive practices of documentation, voice recordings, videos, pictures, some done secretly, others done openly. Many videos were shared by our family members among us, a timeline of decline. And I just wanna share with you a few clips of some of these videos to give you an idea of the type of documentation. You might say there, what can they do? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So he goes out, he likes to sit a plant like this. Uh -huh. And it was, it, it was pretty. Yeah. There's a couple of poles coming, they're coming down. So I sat down <laughs> and did something. Here comes that thing. All the things up here. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, well. No oh, well. I have, I mean, they never have another one. So. This is farther along while she's in her hospice bed. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Okay, now go like this. You're all right, you're all right. Now bring them in like this. Watch, do this. Look like that. There you go, see? Okay. Okay, now go back out and touch your fingers. Like this. Do your thumbs too. Do your thumbs. Come on, get your thumbs out there. Come on, do these. Come on, you can do it. You did it a second ago. That's all right. Do it again, try, try. Go on, try. Yeah, you can. Don't, you never can say you can't. There, you got that one. Bring it. Bring, bring, bring thumb up. How's your cock? How's your cock? Yeah, try the clapping. Sounds a little okay, better since we lived here last week. Shut. You're not coughing. Yeah, so good. There you go. You got it. Next, let's clap. Oh, let's clap. Good yeah. job, Mom. <clears throat> good job. See? Mm -hmm. You did good. Hand eye coordination. You got that. Yeah. Oh, we're going to go shopping and then we're going to go back home. We all went out to eat together. She's got the temperature. Yeah, she, she read the temperature on TV, 53. Where do I live at? <laughs> Lord, I don't know. <laughs> Hutchinson. And finally, this is an interaction I had with her, I think probably about a week before she died. Video functions a little tricky on here. Thank you. I think I have to go. There we go. For both of them, it was death by a thousand little cuts. His strength, her mental abilities got worse and worse. They hardly ever left their house. My grandmother was such a handful that she often fought to stay home, afraid of not knowing what was happening. So they mostly stopped going out. Their lives got smaller and smaller, and through it out, throughout it all, my family obsessively documented their lives. For her, it was a loss of comprehension and speech. For him, it was finding his identity as a necessary needed figure fade little by little, discovering even his own workplace brought to the ground obsolete. This is a video 
that my mother took driving him around to old haunts around Kansas. This was the station he used to work at of formerly West Star Energy. So how many years did you work here? Five. Five years? What did you do? I was pump operator. Pump operator. Took care of the coolant towers. Yeah. So there were four towers. Pardon? There were four towers. Yeah. And there's just the one left. This documentation was integral to our mourning process, the anticipation of their deaths and the acceptance of that inevitability. These old photos, people I didn't know at a different time in their lives, but the objects around them often remain the same. This jacket pictured, I am currently wearing. These inherited items follow through. The new documentation showed another person as well, someone known and unknown, in my grandmother's case, a childlike shell. These are some of the last photos prior to her death. This was on Valentine's Day last year. So we're coming up on the one year anniversary. These are the last photos I took before she died. This was the last time I saw her the day after uh, Valentine's Day. Some of these photos were taken through glass. This is the last photo we have of my grandfather when he was in the nursing home. You can see in the background a hand pressed against glass in the reflection. And these are their photos as they lay in death. Compare images like these to coffin photos curated, edited. Documentation until the end and beyond. These are pictures of a house they built together that no longer houses their presence. This house underwent a renovation and now I currently live there. After image, a type of optical illusion in which an image continues to briefly appear even after exposure to the actual image has ended. What remains after a grieving experience? How can I take all this research, these videos, these voice recordings, these images and encapsulate it? The idea of this work formed during the onslaught of the pandemic in early March, directly after the death of my maternal grandmother. I wanted to create something that centered around the idea of depicting a familial death in the tradition of artists like Lucian Freud and Maggie Hambling. While it is not important to know the specifics of the loss of one particular woman, nor the specifics of my particular history with this woman, it was important to me to impart the emotional turmoil one experiences as an outsider watching someone experience their final days. This work is about being present in the room with the dying. It is about the repetition of conversation around the subject of dying, the, degra the degrading of conversation due to a brain eroded by Alzheimer's, this work is about erosion via repetition and lapses that are increasingly present in individuals with Alzheimer's. Through the process, you witness the deconstruction of that known entity and the scraping of the shared history of two individuals, the text reflecting a repetition of lines that suggest a loss of one's voice and ability to act in the physical world. Utilizing the idea of a spiritual journey through the known cultural connection of Dante's divine comedy, as an entry point into my personal journey of assisting someone into different stages of decline, ending in death, performed in small gestures such as the holding of her hand while she slept. Titled Little Helen, which was my nickname due to our close bond, features four drawings, Inferno, Purgatory, Paradise, and Memento Mori. Features 
These, this features images taken by myself and other family members during her last days and an image on her deathbed. Done in graphite charcoal and watercolor on Reeves BFK, these also have transparencies with printed text on them overlaid. The text from Dante's Divine Comedy is a reflection of a conversation, possibly one-sided, possibly shared, about dying and about seeing someone die, going through the steps of a decline, a loss of memory, a loss of self, and finally a loss of body. These lines are pulled directly from Dante and each drawing features a selection of lines unique to that stage. Inferno featuring lines from Inferno, Purgatory featuring lines from Inferno and Purgatory, and finally Paradise featuring lines from all three. As the text goes on, it begins to reflect a deterioration in memory. Sections are misremembered, shortened. The viewer can think back to what the line should be from previous sections, but as the words get more and more jumbled, the meaning becomes more obscure. One of the ways I wanted to represent Alzheimer's is a slow slip into confusion. He instead of she, him instead of her, a common issue with my grandmother. And yet the plasticity of the mind and our ability to read jumbled words allows us to still understand most of the text because we read in context multiple words at once. This understanding also reflects what it is like talking to someone with Alzheimer's, missed words and stumbles, but still mainly understood by context or sentiment. Here's a detail of Inferno. All natures lean through the vast sea of being and each one that have intelligence and love are pierced, sensibly present. There marked I, Helen, for whose sake so long, how in these gnarled joints the soul is tied, then feeding caused both pain and for the pain, deserted now like a forbidden thing. Such I became not having power to speak and this condition which appears so low were in some part neglected and made void. Pursued her when in dimness she was lost, my wish more earnestly than language could. Grief so deep, the language of our sense and memory. Deep the tongue must wag in vain, vanished as heavy substance through deep wave. They live yet never known satiety, then manifested by transparency as joy through pupil, the living eye. That memory cannot follow. Make me such a vessel of thy worth by those brief words accompany with smiles she towards me bent her eyes with such a look, and word and motion bent from her to learn what web it was through which she had not drawn from the world to follow her when young, from him like me, were in some part neglected and made void. Her silence and changed look did keep me dumb, all nature's lean, whither the line is drawn, that memory cannot follow. I gave me wholly and consigned mine arms from her like me, she ceased from further talk and then began, vanished as heavy substance through deep wave. This is purgatory. Some detail shots. <clears throat> Brief words with smiles, I recognize the trembling of the sea. Towards me bent her eyes with such a look her silence and changed look did keep me dumb. All nature's lean, whither the line is drawn, a line lost. Recognized through the vast sea of being and those that have intelligence and love are pierced. I gave me wholly and consigned mine arms and this condition which appears so low in some part neglected and made void makes thee fall back in unsound vacancy. When nature gave it to inform her mold to do what they had gladly left undone, our mind can satisfy her thirst to know, satisfy and keep me numb. As though through pupil of the living eye, vanished as heavy substance through deep wave, I pursued her when in dimness she was lost as though translucent and smooth glass or wave. As that its bed is dark, the shape returns, they live manifested by transparency. So said she turned toward the heaven her face, I recognize the trembling of the sea. Along the solitary plain we went and word and motion bent from her to learn to follow her when young from her, like me, neglected, made. This is a human body which you see set in the shape of that cold animal. Paradise. Memory. As though translucent, its bed is dark, the shape returns, the shape returns. She cried at this, my smiling, I see, she cried. Makes thee fall back in unsound vacancy, in some part neglected and made void. Memory shall quiver where it falls, fails, faults, 
And this condition which appears so low, neglected, void, that which have intelligence and love, all nature's lean. I gave me holy arms, vanished as heavy substance through deep wave, when nature gave it to inform his mold, to do what they had gladly left undone, our mind can satisfy his thirst to know her silence and changed look did keep me dumb. All nature's lean through the vast sea of being and each one that have intelligence and love form her like me. She ceased from further talk. She ceased from further talk and substance, heavy substance through deep wave. Pursue her in dimness. She was lost, heavy substance. Her silence and changed look did keep me dumb, dumb, dumb. Please make me such a vessel of thy worth by those brief words. She towards me bent her eyes with such a look, a look, vicious fondness. And finally, this is the memento mori, the last piece. So with all this documentation, one would ask why not just show the photos? An important part of the research, I've always felt that the photo was limited to the situation in which it was taken. Documentary, a fly on the wall. The artist behind the camera is not seen or known. The photos were taken in a voyeuristic fashion without consent. In this case, often while the subject was unconscious. The intention was that these photos were private, meant only for me. They care not about good lighting, angles or perspective. They are placeholders of a lived experience blurry for my single hand that held the camera shook as my other hand was holding hers while she slept. But when translated into a drawing, these images become sensory, surface memory, textures, colors, acting as feelings, visceral details that every eye can know, wet, dry, soft, hard, dark, light, saturate, pale. The line of the pencil, soft or hard, indicating the touch of the artist, it is interactive in a way that the photo is not. It is also a translation of that sensory memory, what I fixated on when in her presence and how objects and patterns over, overwhelmed her, small as she was in that bed. This translation from reference to drawing is a play for ownership over a situation in which I felt I had no control. It is both a heightening of memory and a desensitization to the knee-jerk reaction of grief and seeing these photos for hours at a time, exposure therapy allowing enough objectivity to find that distance between features that makes you recognizable. Portraiture can be a radical acceptance of perceived imperfection, details lovingly recreated for the sake of likeness. To me, photography is about shared witness, shared witnesses, having someone see inside the inner circle in the moment of high emotion, while drawing is about shared memory, having someone experience a moment on a sensory level feel what they felt. It is a look inside the head of the artist, a view into something that is highly subjective and curated to highlight a particular feeling or a particular detail that would otherwise be lost or overpowered within the entirety of an image. It is highly personalized in a way that betrays one's intimacy, tenderness, anger, fear, whatever feeling with or of the subject matter. In both the work I enjoy and in my personal work, I prefer art that has something of an unfinished quality, some sense of selective finish that infuses the work with a particular sense of storytelling, giving insight into how the artist feels through a particular problem. This selective finish represents a lot of potential for additional narrative. It represents the full process of creating, the making, the staring, the wondering, and the consideration of things to come. These are in progress details of some of the works. And yet, despite the jarring reference imagery, the work is safe. It is made aesthetically beautiful. It is not a gut punch. Some power of the image is admittedly removed, but other things take precedence. Like the death masks, certain physical details surface take over. The sallow, oily texture of the skin rendered in ink and watercolor. The jagged, crusty nature of her teeth within a gaping mouth recreated by using an X-Acto knife to cut away and pluck and mar the surface of the paper. The final piece, Memento Mori, is the standout in my mind, the drawing done on tracing paper, a delicate ephemeral material that will not hold up to time, was chosen because its ghostly translucency allows a shadow of a pillowcase to show through. 
kind of manual Photoshop layering. But underneath the drawing and pillowcase, just as important as the drawing itself, this is the pillowcase that's layered underneath. This is the pillowcase she died on, kept and made important. An object that cradled her unto death during hospice, an object that represents the subject by proxy in my mind, a pillowcase that will go on my bed and continued use. I wanna thank you for joining me today and listening to this presentation. I did wanna point out that I was delighted to see that downstairs in the uh, first floor Ulrich Gallery, there's this beautiful project called Matrilineal Memories in which people are sharing their memories of their mothers and grandmothers' homes. And there's lots of old photography there as well that is quite interesting to look at. So I encourage you to both see the biennial show and to also partake in the other Ulrich shows currently as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the show and give back I'm gonna, permission. I'm gonna start adding everyone so that you can join the Q&A. And we do wanna respect everyone's time this morning. So I will move through here as quickly as possible. You should receive a notification through Zoom that you can turn on your camera and mic. Do any who have who have joined us, do you have a question you'd like to pose to either Megan or Tana? Uh, Jana, I don't have a question, but I did want to make a comment. Uh, this is Jeff Pulaski. Uh, Tana and Megan, uh, great presentations. I like seeing your work, and I love hearing more about the uh, background behind them. So good job. Congratulations. And um, I look forward to seeing more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. As I cleaned your office. <laughs> Paget, good morning. Can I just ask a question, kind of out of curiosity? Yes, please. It's like yeah. it's you know, it's not like an art historian question or anything, but uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, both of you, but especially Megan. Like, when did you develop? And I apologize if you said it and I missed it, but like, when did you develop an interest in death? How early? Um, and I can really, like, I guess I'm curious because like, I feel like I'm somebody who is interested in death and I'm kind of like the keeper of family memories in my family too. But I also feel like I was kind of a sad, weird little kid. And uh, I'm wondering like, yeah, if that was a, if that was a strange thing to be interested in as a child and like how you transformed it into an artistic inspiration. Um, Tana, do you mind if I take this first? Uh, yes, please take it first. Um, I think when I was young, I had a strong interest in uh, adding to the legacy of the family, having children. And as I got older, that interest just kind of completely died out. Um, I, I think my contribution to the family and its legacy at this point has a lot to do with the kind of housing and the scanning and the uploading and the sharing um, of the personal history and the photographs. And I think that's really, you know, kind of around middle school age when I first inherited uh, my great grandmother's Lucille's photos was when I really started getting interested 
and uh, really wanting to learn the family trees. And I mean, there's a lot of information. When I was little, no one in my family told us anything bad about the family, you know, nobody killed themselves, nobody was crazy, nobody had a lobotomy, nobody was abused. Um, but you know, the older I got, you know, it wasn't so much that this stuff came out in conversation, this stuff came out in photos. A photo would come out, someone was like, well, that's a bad person. They're no longer part of the family. Well, why is that? You know, this person committed suicide, this person had a lobotomy and that went wrong and had to live with his mother the rest of his life. You know, like these, these are the things that come up and you know, it's morbid and yet it's very interesting. And so that's kind of where that started for me. For me, I, I think my connection to death uh, didn't really start out with a connection to death. It started out with a connection to bodies um, and the body. Uh, and how, how our physical presence and representations of that um, is encapsulated uh, our identity and and the other things that go into a person that, of being. Um, so when my grandmother started to decline, I'm like, how do I capture that? And not in a way that is like for preservation, but it, in a way for me to process the loss of her physical presence. Um, and for me, it was, it was exploring through hair. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for Tina. Um, this is Lily. Um, so I was really curious about, um, and you mentioned briefly about like the beauty standards that you kind of think about with when you use hair. Um, so how do you go about, you know, choosing the color of the hair? Does it have any significance? Um, and also, I'm just curious about how you work with it. Like, is it like, bits of hair or does it all come like a wig or something that you kind of connect just kind of curious about those things um yeah so there's a lot to unpack in that uh first off um i i try to limit myself to myself when it comes to hair uh because if we think of hair as like, and the keeping of hair or the not keeping of hair as one of our, the, the first like visual out, outward expressions of self. Uh, like when I first met Megan, I thought, wow, curls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so with that, like I, I'm hyper aware of my, my person when it comes to hair and and by that i mean i am uh, a 30 year old white woman in america with darker relatively straight hair um this this is heightened by how i source my hair i go to a lot of wig shops that are usually catering towards uh, african-american clientele and usually owned by um asian uh people of asian descent um and when I walk into these spaces, I feel almost like, almost voyeuristic, like I'm not supposed to be here. And there are so many options, so many different ways of, of dealing with hair, both in synthetic and, and human, that I am overwhelmed by different standards of, of beauty. And it's constantly in my brain. And I'm constantly thinking about it, about how I'm going to deal with it. Um, so the physical working with hair, it's getting really hard, Lily. <laughs> it's getting really hard to source, um, human hair. Cause I do like working with human hair better. I like working with it in a weft form where it's like on a, a sewed string, it's much easier to work with it that way. And I also like working with full wigs, but human hair is so hard to source ethically. Um, and it's super expensive. So I'm having to go towards more synthetics for the type of look that I am going for. And uh, yeah, I love hair. I'm weird. I know. Now I love it. <laughs> Thank you.
Do we have any other questions? Oh, I just want to say, Megan, thanks for plugging the um, Solving for X project. And you're, I'm looking at the net, you're all invited to participate. So if you're connected to Wichita State University in any way, and I guess that's the control group for their research, um, you can go to the website and enter your story. So it's a progressive exhibition. Um, it grows as those stories come in and that'll continue through May. Um, so please think about participating. And the research, you know, these are two faculty members. So like all of you guys up on the second floor showing your work, the results of your research. This is uh, Chela. Clausen from the dance program, who's working with um, Twyla, Jana, help me. Dr. Uh, Twyla Hill. Twyla Hill from sociology. So there's a connection in that capacity. So thanks, so thanks. Great talk, great exhibition. Yeah, this was fantastic. Thank you guys so much for sharing, for sharing your process, so thank you set a high standard for all of our upcoming talks. <laughs> yes, indeed. And our next faculty talk is next week. Uh, second duo is on, I'm sorry, I'm just, I want to make sure I get the date correct. Uh, Thursday, February 18th at 10 a.m. And we will be joined by um, Irma Puskarevic, oh, I'm sorry, Puskarevic and uh, John Hammer. So please join us next week. Uh, I'm sure they will uh, continue to raise the bar on, uh, on these presentations. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tana. And uh, we'll see you all. We'll see you all next week. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi, Pat. Hey, Tiana. Thank you. Hi, Jana. Oh, hi. It's hi. Ruth. Is that Ruthie? It, it hi. is. Hi, sweetie. How okay. are you?